you ever have one of those days where just kind of everything just kind of builds and kind of keeps going the wrong direction? Well, if you didn't have one of those days before, you're a wreck smack in the middle. Of it. So if I happen to burst into flames here in the middle of my sermon, just think nothing, think nothing of it. Uh, this is a, it is such a strange um, time of the year. And I'm sure that by now all of you are probably starting to chart out your plans for uh, Black Friday. And uh, so that you've got everything written down as to which stores that you're going to visit uh, as quickly as you possibly can. You know, I, I, just, I just don't get that. I mean, if there's any time to stay away from the mall, that would be the <laughs> time to stay uh, away from, from, from the mall. But for some reason, we, we just kind of... We just kind of wade into it. Now, uh, for those of you who haven't been with us, we've been talking about the concept of Thanksgiving, but kind of approaching it in a little bit of a different fashion. And the first week, we, two weeks ago, we talked about the, the 10 lepers, and only one of them returned to, uh, to thank Jesus for that. He was the one who was spiritually healed. The doorway to, the doorway to salvation goes right through Thanksgiving. Last week, we, we talked about the, the tax collector and the Pharisee and how the doorway to Thanksgiving then, in turn, is through humility. We have to find our, our direction. Now, the bad news is that uh, this morning I want to talk to you about what the doorway to humility is. And to be honest with you, the doorway to humility only goes, uh, only go, goes under this arch that is marked adversity. We all know about those things, and, and before we dive into that and get started, let's let's pray together. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you have done for us. I thank you for the fact that every day of our lives that you do not leave us wanting, that you, you give us all the things that we need. And Father, I pray this morning that as, as we come into this room that the things that we would learn from you would be the things that we that we need to hear, the things that would encourage us and, and help us to know that you have all things under control. Uh, Father, I pray that you would forgive my sinfulness, uh, for you know that, that my sins are many, and that you would cut through myself, and that you would speak uh, to my friends your words, because they don't need words from me, but they do need words from you. And so, Father, I, I pray this morning that you would just touch us in ways that are unimaginable and help us to understand that you have life all under control and you are taking us where we need to go. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So if you've uh, got your Bibles or, or a Bible app with you uh, this morning, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians and uh, turn to the, tw to the 12th chapter in 2 Corinthians. And uh, our text for this morning will be from the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, the 7th through the 9th verses. Now i got to warn you up front is that we're still approaching this in a little bit of a strange way. Uh, but stay with me uh, as we unfold uh, what I believe God wants for us to hear. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, or chapter 12, starting with verse 7, seven says this, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a message, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Well, let me set this let, let me set the stage here for you. Now, Jesus used a lot of parables. And uh, so this morning, I, I want to start out with a, a parable of our own. My parables are probably a little bit more absurd than his parables, but, but uh, just bear with me. Let's say that um, there are about a half a dozen of us, and we are on this chartered flight uh, from one coast to the other coast. Now, you know how absurd that would be, because you would never find me on a chartered flight. Um, but let's just for a moment, let's just, just go there. And we are in, in, in an airplane on this chartered flight. And all of a sudden, the pilot comes out of the cockpit and he comes into the cabin and says, well, the engines have just burst into flames. 
and we're going to have to get our parachutes and we're going to have to jump, we're going to have to abandon this plane. Now, he starts to instruct us and we're glad because he knows how the parachutes work and we don't. And we're glad because he knows where the parachutes are and we don't know where they are. And so he, 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 he beckons us to, to come. And so the first person that comes before him and stands as the wind is starting to rush in in the cabin and, and says, may I make a request? And the pilot says, certainly you may make a request. And he says, would it be OK if I had a blue and orange parachute? <laughs> uh, because I'm a big fan of the Broncos. And I want to look good on the way down. <coughs> And the pilot responds, he says, no, I cannot, I, I cannot promise you a blue and orange parachute, but I will give you a parachute that will get you safely to the ground. The next person says, um, I, I, I'd like to know if it's okay if, if you would give me something so that I don't get nauseated on the, on the way to the ground. And the pilot says, no, I, I, I can't promise you that you are not going to get nauseated on the way to the ground, but I'm going to give you a parachute so that you will get safely to the ground. The next person <coughs> comes, comes in line and says, well, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I just got some new boots. And, and I really don't want to get my boots muddy, so could you promise me that I won't get muddy when I, when I land with the parachute? And the pilot says, no, I cannot promise you that you won't get your shoes, your new boots muddy, but I can promise you that here is some equipment that you will get safely to the ground. And on and on the requests go. And the, parish, and the pilot continues to say the same thing. My parachute is, is, is enough. You're going to get to the ground. Now, how absurd does that sound? I mean, maybe it's, it, it's very absurd with a pilot and, and with parachutes. But we do the same thing with God. Over a thousand times, I, I would guess per second, God gets all kinds of requests, thousands of requests every second, and many of them are in the variety of a blue and orange parachute. God, I am thankful that you have paved the way to salvation, that you have given me Jesus, but if it's okay, could you give me a parking space? Or God, I, I am so thankful that I am, am covered by the blood of, by blood of the Lamb, but I, I have a I have a chemistry test coming up this week. I haven't really studied for it, though. So could you just could you just make it happen well for me? Or God, I am so thankful for Jesus and all that you've done and all that you have given. But would it be okay if you if you just saw in turn of the the people who are deciding on a promotion at work? But God says, my grace is sufficient for you. I want to start asking you a question this morning. What if the one thing that you want is the one thing that you never get? What if God says, my grace is sufficient for you? But if God says, Here is a, here's a parachute, I promise you that you will get to the ground safely, but I will not promise you that you will not have any turbulence. This life that we live is a great life. I mean, we live in this land of, of milk and honey, but sometimes the honey could be sweeter and the milk could be a little bit cooler. And so we come to God and, and we bring God requests, sometimes Sometimes about unpaid bills, or unborn children, or unmarried lives. And, and, and we make our request to God. And we just pray that God, if you would just give me an open door, if you would just give me an extra day, if you would just give me an answered prayer, and we pledge that we will be eternally, and we probably will be, eternally thankful for these things, but God says, my grace is enough. Now, it's, it's not in the asking 
of the prayers because the Bible says this very clearly. The Apostle Paul would tell the Philippians, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with, and there's that word, thanksgiving, present your requests to God. He tells us to pray about all things. So the problem, the problem is, is, is not in the asking of the question. The problem is in accepting the answer when God says no. What if the one thing that you want is the one thing that you never get? Will you be, and here is the word, will you be content? Contentment is, is the idea that, that no matter what happens in, love, in life, the, what God has done is enough. And I trust Him. I trust that, that God is too kind to be cruel. I trust that God is too wise to be unjust. And when I cannot find His hand in action, I trust His heart. I trust Him. What if His only gift what if his only gift was his grace? Would that be sufficient? Now, don't be quick to answer that. It's a hard question. And think about it. What if God said, this is it. This is my grace. What if God says, I have saved you. I have taken care of eternity. But then he left us to fend for ourselves here on this world. Would he be any less God? Would he be any less Jehovah? Can we complain if God says no? It was several years ago that I had this abundant one brought home to me. The kids, my kids of course, are, are 20 years old now. And their first Easter at home was a, was a rough Easter. I had tried to burn down the house by installing a sprinkler system. That's another story in and of itself. But we got back into the house. We got back into the house just after Easter because there was a little bit of smoke damage and we had to stay out of the house a day or so. But we got back in the house and we were moving things around in the kitchen. And we had, we had the stove pulled out. Now, I must tell you that uh, one of my children was a normal child who grew up and crawled and did the normal crawling thing. And my other child never crawled, and I, I won't uh, tell you which one it was, but uh, instead of crawling around, he used to scoot around on his tail end, and he just scoot from place to place to place. And we were in the kitchen that evening, and, and the stove was pulled out, and unfortunately, the 220 outlet for the stove was exposed. And Sam went scooting back and forth and back and forth towards that outlet because he, he had spied it and that was his only goal in life was to do I don't know what with it. And he wasn't, he wasn't more than a foot and a half away from that when I finally realized and grabbed him and pulled him away. And the next morning, as I was in my study and my prayers. I was thanking God for being so, and I was eternally grateful for God being so good that he spared my son. And, and I was just thanking him for that. And it impressed on my mind just as much as God was talking to me, that he said, Lane, if I hadn't spared him, would I be any less God? If I hadn't spared his life, if I had just left you with, with my grace, would I be any less wonderful? Would I be any less Jehovah? You see, the truth is, is that sometimes God hears our honest appeals, our fair requests, and he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now in the passage that we're looking at this morning, it's, it's curiously comforting to me that to know that Paul, who was seems to be one of God's go-to guys in the New Testament, had to wrestle with this issue as well. He knew the angst of unanswered prayer. He and God 
it appears we're not always on the same page. And at the top of his prayer list that he kept talking to God about was this request that he called a thorn in the flesh. Now we're not told what that thorn in the flesh was. We're going to speculate about that in just a bit. But we're not told exactly what the thorn in, in, in his flesh was because maybe it was too intimate a thing for just something just between God and Paul. Or maybe it was something that Paul had talked about so many times that everybody knew and he was just using a code word to talk about. Or maybe, maybe we're not told so that that thorn in, that, in the flesh can represent all of our thorns in the flesh. Because somewhere along this life's journey, we have been pierced with adversity. Unless you are very, very unusual, you have found that some of the things that you wanted, you didn't get. And if you have never known what it's like to have a prayer that wasn't answered exactly the way that you wanted it to, then I have one suggestion for you. Try praying. Honestly. Because it's going to happen. Somewhere along the line, we are pierced. Maybe some person does it, or, or maybe it's a problem in life or something puzzling about this life that we just cannot figure out, but we are pierced with adversity. And finally, we plead to God for help. And I find Paul doing that in his life. Is that he begs God to take this thorn in the flesh away from him. And this is not some King James style prayer where it says, Oh, Heavenly Father, if thou wilt, if thou be able, wilt thou, wilt thou take this, this thorn away from me? I, I get more than just saying, Help! Help! Because on his journeys, and his journeys were many, Paul picked up some kind of thorn. And whatever it was, three times we're told that he pulled aside and he said, let's make this our topic of priority today. We just want to talk about this. Let's focus on this. Let's get up close and honest about this. This is not a secondary thought. This is not some superficial wish. God, I need you to take this away from me. Now the word that's used there for thorn can also be translated as the word stick. And I don't mean the kind of steak that you put on a grill and barbecue. I'm talking about the kind of steak that you drive through the heart of a vampire. The kind of steak that you impale your enemies on. As a matter of fact, J.B. Phillips, in his rendition of the New Testament, translates this word as a stabbing pain. Whatever it was, three times Paul pulls to the side, and he makes not a casual request. But he says, God, I need you to take this away. Would you take this away from me? But God's answer is as clear as Paul's request. All right, let's speculate. For example, a lot of people along the line, of course, over many years, have, have speculated as to what the thing in the flesh was. Maybe if we can figure out, maybe we can understand it a little bit better. And one of the things that comes up quite often is, is in some ways curious to me, but it's the idea that the thorn, that Paul's thorn in the flesh had to do with sexual temptation. I mean, Paul was a single man, and he was journeying from port to port to port, and it, it, kind, of, it kind of makes uh, a little bit of logical sense that it, it could have been some type of sexual temptation that was going on in his life. Uh, look at the book of Romans, the 7th chapter, the 18th and 19th verses. Paul, Paul would say this, I want to do the things that are good, but I do not do them. I do not do the good things I want to do, but I do the bad things I do not want to do. And while it sounds a little bit like Dr. Seuss is reading our mail, it sounds a lot more like somebody who really wants something gone. I mean, God, he wants God to deliver him from something. Others have, have speculated, well, no, I, I don't think that it was a sexual temptation. I think that it was opposition. I think it was probably, or maybe some of Paul's 
foes that were, were getting to him. And, and he wanted those removed for his, from his life. Uh, the text maybe leaves at that a little bit when it says to keep me from becoming conceited. There was giving, giving me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger, a messenger of Satan. I mean, there are many people who opposed him. He never made the top list and the most favorite apostles. And when he says that this thorn in the flesh was to torment him, or again, Philip says to beat me, he means it. Because he can open his cloak and show you his back. And show you what it means. <coughs> Excuse me, to be tormented. Or to be beaten. We can't see his back, but we can hear his words. In 2 Corinthians 11, he says this five times. I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And he was, by the way, he was left for dead at that stoning. It wasn't just a miner throwing the rocks at him. Three times I was shipwrecked. And one of those I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And he goes on to talk about how I was in danger from all kinds of different people. I was in danger from foes. I was even in danger from false Christians, he says. He was a man who knew opposition. And maybe if this opposition was Paul's thorn in the flesh, would we blame him for asking to have it taken away? Because wouldn't he be a better apostle if, if he didn't have all of those things that he had to deal with? I mean, he's in a situation where he says, you know what, the pain from the beatings are so bad I cannot walk. The pain that I have, I cannot sleep. I can't, I can't get on. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better? Uh, but there's, there were those who thought that Paul deserved every whipping, every adversity that he came up against. And that maybe leads us to a third speculation. Because maybe it wasn't, uh, maybe it wasn't uh, sexual temptation or opposition. Maybe it was Paul's abrasive nature. Because Paul was never known for his wonderful personality. We know that he studied the feet of the great Rabbi Gamaliel. And maybe if Gamaliel taught a class on, on public relations or how to get along with your friends, Maybe Paul slept through that class or he missed that day or something. Because the truth is, is that before he became a Christian, Paul killed Christians. After he became a Christian, Paul grilled Christians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 says, When Peter came to Antioch, I challenged him to his face because he was wrong. Spoken like a real diplomat. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he knew things as black and white. You were either on God's side or you were on Satan's side. And if you started to slip from God's side to Satan, he was the first one to let you know it. For example, he talks about a, a couple of guys. He says some people have deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Hymenaeus and Alexander are two examples. So what did I do? I loved them back to Christ. No, he says, I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme God. And it was his abrasive nature that he had to get rid of. Others say, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so much that. I, I think maybe it was his body. Remember how he ends the book of Galatians? To the end, at the end of the book of Galatians, he says, See with what large letters I sign my name. Earlier in the book of Galatians, he says, You would have given your eyes for me. Some people have speculated that maybe he had bad eyesight, maybe for a couple of reasons. Maybe one of the reasons was all the places that he went, he had malaria. And malaria tends to affect the body in that way. Or some people think, you know, it wasn't so much the malaria. Maybe he never got over that Damascus Road experience. Remember that experience? Where God throws on the stadium lights and Paul is blinded. And he is left blinded for three days. And so all he can do is look inside of himself. And he doesn't like what he sees. Would it be wrong for him to ask that this be taken away? 
I mean, Paul himself might say, you know, God, you, you use me to raise people from the dead. Can't I at least have a decent pair of eyes? Because having bad eyes would be, would, would be bad for his line of work. He had to travel a lot of places and he might stumble over rocks in a pathway. Or maybe he's preaching a sermon and he focuses in on a tree thinking it's a person. Aren't they impressed people that way? <laughs> Or maybe the last one for our purposes this morning is wasn't his body, but his oratorical skills. Maybe Paul wanted to be a great preacher. And we think because he was such a great penman, he must have been a wonderful pulpiteer as well. But the scripture gives us an insight that that maybe necessarily wasn't the case. Because in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul writes down what he overheard people say. He said, some say, Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person, he is weak, and his speeches are worthless. I don't know. Maybe it was one of these, or maybe it was something very, very different. But thus, let's, let's back up for, for just a, a second and think about Paul. And, and maybe I've made you think about Paul in, in a different way than you came in here thinking about him this morning, because here is a man who was tempted often, beaten regularly. He was dim-sighted and sharp-tongued. He was a pain in the keister. And it's no wonder that he was single. He probably couldn't get a date. <laughs> and aren't these fair requests? Aren't these fair requests to say, could you take these away from me because I'm, I'm in a process of serving? Aren't any of these a fair request? Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, what if God removed the temptations, the, the, the physical, the sexual temptations from Paul's life? Maybe if those were, were, were all gone. But you know that there has never been anyone who has articulated the grace of God through Jesus Christ better than the Apostle Paul. And that's quite possible because there has never been anyone who appreciated it more than Paul did. If you take away his temptations, you, lose, you find a different man. I mean, he describes himself as the chief of sinners. That's, that's the shingle over the doorway, it seems like. I mean, he seems to time and time tell us that the, the basis of his, of his uh, theology is that I am a great sinner, but God is a, through Jesus, is a great sinner. Savior. And if you take away those temptations, then maybe you don't get the book of Romans. Maybe we don't see the insight into that man and, and, and those things are gone and he doesn't go through those temptations so that we're not able to identify them as we are when we read that book. What about if God took away the opposition? Wouldn't it be better? Maybe. Maybe not. Wasn't it Jesus who one time said, anybody can love a friend. But it's only through the strength and the power of God that you can love an enemy. And Paul would articulate this when he writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, even if I were burned, if my body was burned for preaching the gospel, if I didn't love, I would be nothing. I mean, he boiled down his life to say that he was motivated by one thing, that the love of Christ, the love of Christ compels me. Or what about his personality? If he were meek and mild, what if he was a kinder, gentler version of the Apostle Paul? Then let me tell you something. We wouldn't have, we certainly wouldn't have the two letters to the Corinthians. Because those two letters are written by a guy who is absolutely intolerant of a sloppy faith. In the book of Galatians, he writes, because he is intolerant of those who would trample on the grace of God. How about if God healed his eyes? You know, it's maybe, maybe it's only because he didn't have clear vision in this sense that he was able to so clearly see the cross. 
or how about oratorical skills? There's nothing that is intoxicating as, as public approval. And these things were to keep him humble. Because the purpose, there is a purpose in all of this. And Paul knew that purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, To keep me from becoming conceited. Peter said that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Gives grace to the humble. And God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient. And what if he's saying the same thing to you this morning? My grace is sufficient. What if the one thing that you want is the one thing that you can get? What if God never removes temptation from your life? Maybe the only way that he can help us to understand how important the grace of God is, is for us to stumble and to fall. Maybe a time or two or three or more. Maybe the only way that we learn about God's grace is by our falling. Or what about enemies? What if some of you can probably put a name and a face to that enemy and you think, you know what, God, life would be better if you would take this person out of the way and I could even witness for you better. But maybe he never takes them away so that we learn to love like God. Maybe you're wondering why God doesn't change your personality. Probably two or three people within your shop are wondering the same thing. Maybe you have some rough edges in your life. Maybe you say things that later you wish you hadn't said or do do things that you wish that, that, that you hadn't done. And you say, God, I wish that you would make me more like Jesus. Let me tell you this. He is making you. He is making you like Jesus. You are just in process. And he will take you there. Or maybe you ask the question, why haven't I been healed? Why haven't people who are close to me been healed? And, and I want to say this gently. I don't want to say this kind of, but I want to say it straightforwardly, is that you have been healed. God has healed you. He has healed both your soul and your body. But in God's providence, He gives you the perfected soul first. For there is, there is no flaw in a soul that is saved by God. What if he never heals your body or those who are close to you? What if you say, you know what, if, if I could just have a different body? Well, let me ask you a question. Would you trade 77 or 85 or 95 years of a perfect body at the exchange for your soul? Of course you wouldn't. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And his grace is sufficient always. His grace is sufficient for your self-image. Now, of all the things that we don't know about a thorn, we do know this, is that God would rather have you walk with a temporary limp than, than a perpetual strut. And God loves us enough that if that thorn is the only way that we are humbled before him and see his grace, that he is great enough not to take that thorn out of our lives. And so I tell you, do not interpret, do not ever, ever interpret his denial as a lack of love, but simply as a sign of his sovereignty. So where do we go with this? Paul writes these words just a little in his life. To the Th Christians in Thessalonica. He says, be joyful always. Pray continually and give 
thanks in all circumstances. But this is God's will for you, Christ Jesus. The doorway to humility is labeled adversity. But he is taking you through that. Now next week we're going to come in here together and, and, and I've already talked about that. So we're going to spend the whole time thanking God. And my hope has been in these past few weeks that maybe we get a little bit, a little get closer, get a little closer to the heart of Thanksgiving. Not the superficial stuff that we try to pass off. Because we have determined that we will be a church here. That we won't just be a group of people who does things, but we will be a church here. And we will open our hearts. And we will give thanks for the things that He has done. And we will be in great, great celebration.